Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm the Director of Voices and Leadership and today I'm honored to introduce the President of our University. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. And this event takes place in the Leadership Studio, whose programs have been viewed more than 4 million times in 200 countries since its inception in 2010. Today we host a discussion on leading during challenging times in higher education with Dean Michelle Williams and President Larry Bacow. Larry Bacow is the 29th president of Harvard University. From 2001 to 2011, he was the president of Tufts University, where he advanced the university's commitment to excellence in teaching, research, and public service, and fostered collaboration across the university's eight schools. Before his time at Tufts, President Bacow spent 24 years on the faculty of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He served as chair of the faculty and then as chancellor. He also served as a member of the Harvard Corporation. One of the most widely experienced leaders in American higher education, President Bacow is known for his commitment to expanding student opportunity, catalyzing academic innovation, and encouraging university civic engagement and service to society. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, our own Dean Michelle Williams, please join me as we welcome President Larry Bacow to the Voices Leadership Series here at the Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, President Bacow. Come Thank on, Michelle, you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, but I wanted to illustrate my respect well, for the thank position you. that you hold. And so, thank you, Larry. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon, and thank you to everyone here in the studio and the thousands of you viewing us online. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be. Um, hosting this session uh, with, with Larry. Larry, as you know, this is a leadership studio, mm -hmm. and I cannot help but start with asking you to share with our audience your personal journey in leadership. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to, to have this conversation. Um, I sometimes describe myself as an accidental president. <laughs> uh, uh, as was noted, I, I Spent 24 years on the faculty at MIT. For 21 of those years, I, uh, I worked really, really hard to avoid being anything other than a faculty member. I enjoyed my teaching. I enjoyed my scholarship. Um, I figured, why screw it up by becoming a department chair or, God forbid, a dean? Uh, <laughs> and um, I was actually on sabbatical writing a book um, on trade policy and the environment in Amsterdam when I got, I got a call asking me uh, when I returned if I would consider being chairman of the MIT faculty. Mm. Uh, it's not really an administrative job. It's sort of like being shop steward of the faculty. It's a half-time commitment. But it's in the, uh, uh, at MIT, it's the kind of thing that when invited to do it, you don't say no. Uh, you're sort of serving your colleagues. So I agreed to do that and uh, then spent the next two years working very, very closely uh, with the president and the provost, um, which is what the chair of the faculty does. And then I finished my term, I went back to my teaching and my research, and then a year later, um, the provost stepped down, the president went looking for a new provost, there were sort of two people that the faculty kept saying you should take a look at. I was one of them, uh, Bob Brown, who was then the mm -hmm. dean of engineering, was the other, uh, now president of, of Boston University. And uh, Chuck Vest, who was president at the time, decided he wanted both of us. And so, you know, MIT had been very good to me. I'd been an undergraduate there. I'd been a faculty member there. The president asks. I saw it as an opportunity to serve. Uh, Chuck to, allowed Bob and I to figure out how to divide the job between the two of us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, MIT is very centralized, and so everything was going through the provost's office. It was getting bogged down, and thought was two people parallel processing. So that's how I became chancellor of MIT, which is sort of half a provost. And then if you have the number two job at a place like MIT, you get called for virtually every presidential search in the country. <laughs> and I didn't think I wanted to be a president. I kept saying no. Uh, in fact, I would tell you some of the best career decisions I've ever made in my life are jobs I have not taken. Uh, and then... Elaborate uh, on that a little bit. <laughs> That's a very interesting point. I think a point that few leaders in this studio have addressed. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of jobs that have fabulous titles and from a distance looks like something that you should want to do. Um, but if you dig down deep, mm. you find they're not such great jobs or they're, you're not well suited for them. Mm. or it wouldn't be a good match, or it's the wrong time. Um, you know, uh, I didn't think I wanted to be a university president. Um, uh, I, again, I liked doing what I was doing. Um, when I talk to people who are thinking about taking a job like this, I say, you know, ask yourself what you really want to get done. Uh, take a job because you have an agenda not because the job is just there. Hmm. So, and the second thing I always advise people to, is to think about the fit between themselves and the institution. Hmm. And, um, you know, a number of these things, I didn't think the fit was right. I loved MIT, I figured why leave. Um, in a moment of weakness, I agreed to have a conversation um, with the search <laughs> committee uh, at, at Tufts. The, search consultant who was doing the search was somebody I had known for 30 years. Um, had actually, he had married a graduate school classmate of mine. I was at their wedding. Mm. And, and he, he said, why do you keep saying no? And I said, I, I'm very happy. I don't think mm. I want to be a president. Mm. He said, well, let me just have a conversation with you. And he, I agreed to have a conversation with the search committee just to sort of explore it. I'll never forget what Chuck Vest, who was president of MIT, said to me at the time when I went to him for advice. He said, beware the vortex. I hmm. said, what do you mean by that, Chuck? He said, well, you put your toe in thinking that you're just there to learn something and you sort of get sucked in and before you know it, they're offering you the job and then you feel like you have to say yes. Mm -hmm. So make sure that it's something that you really want to do before you go talk to them. So that's how I, yeah. I wound up. But I should tell you that not only had I never been a department chair or a dean, but when I became president of Tufts, literally the only other thing I had ever been president of in my life was the National Honor Society in high school. My senior <laughs> year. And there we held one meeting a year, and that was to elect the officers for the next year. So it's a great was, proving ground. So my you, leadership journey. You mentioned um, at the time you uh, took on the leadership responsibility in, at MIT that everything was centralized. Yeah. And I recognize that there are different sets of challenges when you're in, in an ecosystem that is best characterized as centralized versus those that are best dis characterized as decentralized. Can you share with us what are some of the um, different experiences you've had in these different types of ecosystems where you have been leader? Well. Every institution has its own culture and its own organization. And one of the challenges when you come into a leadership position, especially from the outside, is to try and understand that culture mm -hmm. uh, before you attempt to actually, uh, and the organization before you attempt to change it. And uh, I think it's important that when you start out that you think of yourself as a cultural anthropologist mm -hmm. who's been sort of mm -hmm. parachuted mm -hmm. into some remote territory, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't speak the language, and you don't know what the social conventions are, and you have to figure them out for yourself through careful observation. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, Harvard and MIT are interesting because they are so different. And I'm often asked about those differences. Mm -hmm. My flip answer is that 
organizationally and culturally they're identical with a sign change. Uh, and it always gets a, a, a laugh, but there's a lot of truth to it. Yeah. And, but what's also interesting to me is that these are two of the world's greatest academic institutions. Um, and what that says to me is that excellence is path independent mm -hmm. of organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and each has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. When I was at MIT, we were constantly trying to push more responsibility out to the schools. We were, in effect, going from centralization to decentralization. Mm -hmm. And at Harvard, where everything is very centralized, um, decentralized. decentralized, excuse me, decentralized, you know, we're often trying to pull things back to the center a little bit. So um, I think that just speaks to the fact that there's more than one way to to organize an institution, and you just need to be cognizant of what are the traditions mm -hmm. and the um, what people know and understand and they're comfortable with, and how do you get them to appreciate that there might in fact be something different that they could benefit from. But you know, each has its own challenges and opportunities. Yeah, thank you for that. I want to switch gears a little bit and refer back to your inaugural address mm -hmm. um, uh, where you spoke about your priorities for Harvard yep. and wondered if you could expand upon those for us. Um, and also I was curious, um, in that same address you said something really quite um, profound. It struck me that you wanted all Harvard students who wanted to have a public service opportunity to have one right. and hoped that you could to speak to that as well. Sure. Well, so uh, these are really interesting and challenging times for higher education. And uh, it's the first time in my lifetime where people have questioned sending a kid to college, whether or not it's worth it. It's the first time in my lifetime that people have questioned whether or not colleges and universities are worthy of public support. Mm. We're actually taxing them now mm. as opposed to supporting some of them. It's the first time in my lifetime where a significant portion of our population has questioned whether or not these great institutions are even good for the nation. Mm -hmm. So m my highest priority is to try and change this narrative mm -hmm. about, about higher education. Um, you know, I, I think that people are casting a critical eye to institutions like Harvard, not just Harvard, but others as well because they think that we're elitist. Uh, they think we're far more concerned about making ourselves great than the world better. Mm -hmm. uh, they think that we're incapable, incapable of controlling our own costs, that there's a lot of public anger mm -hmm. at, at just the breathtakingly expensive you know, cost of uh, college education these days. And then I think there's concern over whether or not institutions like ours are truly as open to new ideas or ideas from across the ideological spectrum as we, as we claim to be. So uh, these are driving actually a lot of my priorities uh, for the institution. Um, uh, Harvard has an extraordinary tradition of, of sending its best and its brightest you know, into public service. Mm. Uh, you know, Right now, there are 14 Harvard graduates <coughs> who are serving in the United States Senate. There are over 40 Harvard graduates who are serving in the House of Representatives. I mean, think about that. Um, uh, it's, it's quite astonishing. Um, we have you know, Harvard graduates on the Supreme Court. We've had multiple yeah. Harvard graduates in the White House. So I think Harvard graduates have always answered the call <laughs> to public service. I want to ensure, though, that every student who wants to sort of um, uh, sample from that opportunity can do so. And that's why I said that I wanted yeah. to ensure that any student who wants to pursue an internship uh, can do it. One of the challenges that we face is that um, we've succeeded in making Harvard accessible now to, to students who come from very poor families uh, and, or families of very modest means. Yeah. Uh, and that's the good news. But those students are often not in a position, for example, to be able to say, you know, I'm going to volunteer um, this summer. 
um, I can afford to do this uh, so that I get the experience. Right. And a lot of these jobs don't pay very much. And so I want to level the playing field. I want to make sure that it, every student who wants it has the opportunity to do it. And, um, and I know that some students will catch the bug and, mm -hmm. and want to continue uh, with that, either as a, as a career or to continue to find ways to serve um, through their volunteer efforts. Right. Uh, and I also think it's necessary that, and this is part of what I want to do, that we try and make it easy for the students who want to go home and serve to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, we send a lot of students to all over the world to try and help yeah. um, needy populations wherever they find them. But one of the reasons why I think we're facing such challenges politically in this country right now is people feel like institutions like Harvard haven't paid enough attention to what goes on in the center of the country. Mm -hmm. And indeed, in many cases, I'm a good example. You know, I grew up in Pontiac, Michigan, which is now the poorest city in the state of Michigan. Okay. Um, and I went to, came to Boston to go to college, and I never left. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we do take the best and the brightest away from places that need yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, maybe if we encourage some of our students to pursue public service opportunities back home, they'll go home. Yeah. Encourage and support them. Because exactly. those students who um, want to go back may not have the means to do so. Correct. And I, I think it's just so important in your inaugural address to actually commit to wanting to make it possible for yep. those who want to go back um, to have a financial pathway to make it happen. Right. And support from the highest level of academic leadership to be engaged publicly and socially. So thank you for that. Thank you. I want to change gears again sure. because time is precious and touch on changed leadership um, during a time that you alluded to where higher ed is under question, maybe even under fire right. in some sectors. Um, and there are areas you know, of concern such as ta taxing endowments mm -hmm. um, and uh, admissions mm -hmm. um, protocols. Sure. And, and wanted to hear from you as a leader of um, Harvard. How does Harvard lead? How do you help right. lead in these conversations? So I think that as leaders, one of the most powerful tools that we have is the opportunity to frame issues for people. I had a law professor who used to say, I can win any argument I want as long as you let me frame the question. <laughs> so the admissions lawsuit is a good example, um, where people have, you know, the plaintiffs in that suit allege that we're discriminating uh, against Asian Americans mm -hmm. because they say if we basically only admitted students based upon their grades and their SAT scores, we would admit slightly more Asian Americans mm -hmm. than we currently do. So I like to respond to that by asking people a number of questions and in doing so framing the issue mm -hmm. in terms of what I think it really represents. Uh, the first point which I, I always make to people is, you know, Harvard would be a very, very dull place if every student who came to Harvard came from the same geographic location, wanted to study exactly the same thing, wanted to pursue precisely the same career path, had exactly the same extracurricular or co-curricular interests. I could go on. We learn from our differences. You know, if everybody came from New Jersey, everybody wanted to study economics, everybody wanted to go work for Goldman Sachs, and everybody wanted to um, play the French horn. I have nothing against people playing the French horn, studying economics, it's my field, you know, working for Goldman Sachs. Uh, that's not the point. It would be a far less interesting place if that were true. Um, and so that's okay. the first point. And so I try and frame it that way. The second way that I try and frame it is that I ask people, how many of you ever hired anybody? If you've hired people, how many of you hired people without interviewing them, without checking their references, without looking at their work product? Well, why not just hire people based upon their grades and nothing more than that? Well, the answer is that all of us are more than our grades and our board scores. And so it, it, it's helping people to understand that we are only doing 
uh, what, what most of us do routinely. Um, and then I also, in, that, in this particular case, make the point that, you know, we're only doing what the Supreme Court has specifically said we could do. Last, two out of the last three cases that have gone to the Supreme Court mm. on race conscious admissions yeah. have specifically cited Harvard yeah. as the gold standard uh, for how an institution can consider race as one factor among many right. in, in constructing a class. So I think leadership involves framing, but it also involves teaching mm -hmm. and helping people to understand and see issues from from your perspective. Yeah. I always try and make my problems other people's problems as a leader. People are forever laying problems at your feet, as right. you know, yeah. as uh, dean of the Chan School. And so, you know, this is why I try and paint a vivid picture for people and say, okay, let's, you know, do we re really want an institution where this is the only way that we select our students? Yeah. I don't think so. And I don't think you want it that way either. So if we can agree on that, then, then yeah you can sort of see how we need to move forward in this way. Yeah. So many rich lessons, framing, teaching, social anthropology. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you to look forward, look ahead mm -hmm. to the challenges um, uh, that we may anticipate um, in higher education uh, going forward. And, and, and maybe even help us think through advancing possible solutions or we're in a school of public health how do we mitigate or prevent some of these challenges and I think I can anticipate some of the right. answers that you might provide here well one of the challenges I think I've always already named and that's changing the narrative about higher education yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we bend the cost curve in, mm -hmm. in, in higher education um, yeah. how do we use technology in ways uh, that allow us to enhance productivity of faculty so that we can make the kind of wonderful education that we have available here more accessible to more people. Uh, you know, we know how to make higher education cheaper. It's not that hard. It's called bigger classes. It's called less hands-on learning, fewer curricular options, less support for co-curricular life, um, simpler facilities, mm -hmm. Uh, less support for students and alumni when they leave the institution. We know how to do it. The problem is that's not what people want. In fact, higher education, one of the challenges in higher education is that competition mm -hmm. tends to drive costs up, not down. Yeah. We need to get a handle on that. I think you know, technology plays a role in that. We're using it today right. as a way of extending this conversation to people literally from around the world and also temporally. Right. Um, so there are ways in which we can do it. The challenge is to figure out how to do it and to preserve all that's special about what happens when we confine students and faculty under temperature and pressure you know, for four years in a residential setting, if we're talking about undergraduate right. education, right. and what also happens in graduate and, mm -hmm. and professional schools. Um, but the Chan School is doing some very interesting experiments right now. Yeah. You know, and using, and using blended technology. learning and using technology yeah. to try and uh, extend things. So uh, that's one way, one big challenge, yeah. and one way which I hope that we will will be different um, uh, going forward. Um, uh, there are other things that I could talk about. Um, we have um, other opportunities that are made available to us mm -hmm. uh, at this point um, because the world is changing in interesting ways. Uh, I think it's really, really interesting watching the conversation that's occurring right now in the tech sector, where there's a lot of hand-wringing that's going on over what our world is going to look like and how it's going to feel as we you know, entrust more and more decisions um, to, to computationally intensive um, solutions, yeah. whether or not we're talking yeah. about machine learning, artificial intelligence, other ways in which yeah. um, our world is going to be driven by this. I think it raises lots of really, really interesting questions of what does it mean to be human yeah. in a world in which uh, an increasing amount of decision making is controlled by machines and not yeah. individuals. And what are the values that are embedded in the algorithms yeah. that are driving this this decision-making process. And I'd like to think 
that as we struggle with those questions, we're starting to understand that we need to think deeply about the ethical yeah. implications of this, about what are the values that are embedded yeah. in the algorithms. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to see interest yeah. uh, in these questions. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we have a tremendously interesting program that's going on right now at, at Harvard, which we call Embedded Ethics, in which we're embedding philosophy graduate students in computer science yeah. courses as yeah. teaching yeah. fellows yeah. to try and stimulate the conversations and to say, yeah. okay, what are the ethical yeah. issues? Yeah. So that people, yeah. people will start to think about those. And as we live in a world in which, again, because of technology, information is now ubiquitous. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. I can answer almost any question. Uh, of a factual nature, you know, just with this little device. We something, no longer something have... Something much more powerful than your first computer. Oh, by a lot. <laughs> but, you know, there are no... People no longer have arguments in bars anymore about, you know, <laughs> you know who batted third for the Red no, Sox in 1948 <laughs> and answer it, answer it in 10 seconds. But the same technology that brings us that also brings us a lot of other things. You know, it makes it, the good news is that it makes it a lot easier for people to connect. Yeah. It also makes it easier for people who have extreme ideas to connect. Yeah. It makes it easier for people to propagate information which is untrue. Um, I'd like to think in this world that we are going to come to understand and appreciate that um, a liberal education is even more valuable Absolutely. because it helps people to uh, differentiate the signal from the noise in a world in which information is ubiquitous. I'd like to think that we're going to have a renaissance in the humanities mm -hmm. as we contemplate what does it mean to be human in a world increasingly dominated by machines? What is it that's distinctly human? Um, you know, that a machine will never replicate. Yeah in understanding what is beautiful. You know, what does it mean to love, to be loved? These are questions which people have been asking for centuries. And, and I think that as I look forward, I, I think we're going to get back to those and understand that they, that they are central to what we do in universities as they have been for centuries. Yeah. I love your vision about our being embedded in these conversations and definitely not standing on the sidelines. Yeah. as these conversations yeah. continue. And the liberal arts education is the most powerful way to prepare us for the future. Well, and also the most powerful way to prepare us for a world in which, again, because technology has broken down so many barriers, um, a, a world in which we are going to have to confront differences daily. Yes. Daily. I regret that we are approaching the end of our session and um, because this has been such a rich conversation. I want to end with asking you if you could share with us today, the students here in the audience and online, um, two top leadership strategies um, as they go forward. In addition to the many that you've already shared, there must be a few more that you can impart in the few minutes we have. Um. So, uh, I would say, I've already said, oh, I'm not going to repeat anything. Uh, I don't know a friend who used to say to me that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who do things and there are those who try and take the credit. Hmm. And it's a lot easier to be a member of the first group because there's a lot less competition. The higher you go in an organization, the less you need credit for anything. And so uh, I think one important leadership lesson that I would leave, leave people with is um, surround yourself with good people and really help them achieve you know, what, what they would want to do. And the last thing I would tell you is uh, if you remember nothing from this conversation, it would be to always do the right thing. It's usually not that figure, difficult to figure out. It's often excruciatingly difficult mm -hmm. to do. And leadership is about doing the right thing, especially when it's very, very hard. You're here. Thank you. Thank you.
I am delighted and honored uh, grateful for the time you've spent with us here in the studio on the Longwood campus here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Thank you, President Bacow, if I may call you President <laughs> Bacow. In honor of our respect, our due respect Thank of you. your leadership of Harvard, and we look forward to you joining us again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.